Sister here for Bison Catholic, and I'm president of NDSU Students for Life, and I have the honor today of introducing our keynote speaker to all of you. Kristen Hawkins is a Christian, wife, mother, grassroots activist, author, speaker, podcast host, and human rights advocate. She is president of Students for Life of America. She was recruited in 2006 to launch Students for Life of America's full-time operation. <laughs> No problem. Oh. Uh oh. Okay. I'm back. Hi, guys. <laughs> since then, since she built up the Students for Life of America, she went from a small organization made up of a few dozen student groups scattered across the country to a coordinated national team serving more than 1,200 Students for Life chapters in all 50 states, one of which includes our Students for Life chapter here at NDSU. She hosts a weekly podcast called Explicitly Pro Life, found on iTunes or YouTube a frequent speaker at college campuses like Harvard, Dartmouth, UC Berkeley, as well as being a media analyst, Kristen's expertise includes abortion, feminism, disability advocacy, and healthcare, as she navigates the social conditions and public policy that impact the human rights issue of our day. She does all of this while multitasking as a mother of four children, two of whom have cystic fibrosis. Kristen knows firsthand that all children have value, no matter the perception of their abilities, and works daily to be a voice for millennials and Gen Z who recognize the horrors of abortion for women and their preborn infants. She also had the honor of announcing the decision to overturn Roe v. Wade on the steps of the U.S. Supreme Court on June 24, 2022. Along with other student activists, I had the opportunity to stand alongside Christian when that decision came out. Bison Catholic and NDC Students for Life has the honor to have her here today to speak to us in a post row America. Please join me in welcoming Kristen Hawkins. There's a button. No. Okay, it's on. Is it? Turn, did you turn the mic off? Okay. All the shy men here won't like touch my button to turn on my mic. <laughs> Never had that happen before. I'm so glad you're joining me in this nice, warm auditorium. I had to keep my, reminding myself all day why I was coming here. I was here for you as I uh, <clears throat> was flying in and had flip flops on at the airport. And everyone made fun of me for wearing flip-flops on the plane. So, um, but I want to thank you all for coming out uh, and listening to the presentation tonight. I think this will be an exciting uh, talk because there's a lot of excitement, um, a lot of momentum that is happening across our country today. Uh, my plan is to speak to you for about half an hour. We'll see. Uh, I'll see. I'll look at your faces, and if I feel like you're engaged or not engaged, I might say or add things to it. Uh, I, but then we can do Q and A. And I can ask, you can ask me any question you would like, um, and I will do the best of my ability to answer your question. Um, a few years ago, uh, Students for Life had the honor of hosting what was a pretty swanky fundraising gala in New York City. It was at the Harvard Club. I still don't know actually how we got uh, into the Harvard Club. I'm certainly not a Harvard graduate. Um, and I'm pretty sure we'll never be invited back because we brought our... Um, uh, defund Planned Parenthood pink van and parked it in front of the, the Harvard Club just so everyone would know we were there. Uh, so that, it's, it's a pretty sure way we won't be invited back. But we had this beautiful gala. The event went well. All my beautiful staff was dressed up in like their former prom dresses. You know, I was I was not very excited to like have to like get on a, put on a dress and high heels. But it was so beautiful. And everyone was so excited to come and talk about why being pro-life in New York City mattered, what more we had to do in this fight at the abortion capital of the world. And, you know, we had some senator folks and congressmen and national talk, talk show hosts. Um, but one of the things that really struck me at the end of the gala, we were cleaning up. 
um, because we call ourselves Gritty at Students for Life. It's a nice word for cheap. Uh, so we were also a cleanup crew in our ball gowns. Um, but while we were cleaning up, one of my uh, trusted mentors came over to me uh, to share some feedback and advice in the night. Uh, and his feedback was pretty interesting because he said, you know, it was beautiful, the food was great, everyone loved it, was so motivated. Uh, but you know, I have you know, I have some stuff that I think you need to think about next time you make a, a speech. And I was you know really interested because there's no like formal school for how to do this work. I took speech class in you know, high school for like one credit. I took like speech class in college, and I had a lot of debates with my college professors. Like that was it. So I was like clued in onto what is going on. I was really clued in to what was going. On. Is it me? I just want to hurt everyone's eardrums. But I was really clued into what was happening. So I was like, okay, give me, Sean, give me your advice. What is your best advice if that was worse? Okay. I don't know, is it turned off? I think it's turned off. It's turned off. No. It's turned off. Here. We don't show everybody in my bra. If we can just. <laughs> Here, I'll just wear it, and then we can sure. deal with it later. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I was asking Sean, you know, give me your best advice. What was your, what did I do wrong? What did I say wrong in my talk? And I'm used to saying the wrong things at the wrong time. And um, his advice kind of shocked me, though. He said, you know, everyone here loved it. They were so inspired. But you need to stop saying things like abolish abortion. Stop saying things like, when Roe versus Wade is reversed. Because nobody here in Manhattan actually believes this is going to happen. And no one's going to take you seriously and invest a serious amount of money that you need to accomplish your vision if they all think you're kind of naive and young when you say this. It was, it was an interesting uh, conundrum for me. Um, because I wanted to raise that money. I needed to raise that money to sustain our nearly 100 staff members and our $20 million operation every year. I need lots of money. If you have it, please donate it to me. Um, but I also thought, you know, leaders always have to envision a win. You have to set, it's sports psychology, right? Like, we can't go out the field and be like, we're going to try our best, but we're going to get our butts kicked. It's not going to work out too well for your team if your coach said that, right? We can't be saying these things. So I'm so honored to say that I don't know what possessed me to, to be so stubborn or what gifting God gave me to be so stubborn, I guess you could say. I, I refuse to stop saying that word, abolish abortion. Or I refuse to stop saying when we will sit, see Roe versus Wade reverse. I continued our quest everywhere we went and everywhere we continue to go today at Students' Life, we continue to lay out what our vision for America is, an America where abortion is unthinkable and also unavailable. And it starts with that achieving that first phase of our movement's goal, which I'm so honored to say I was present for on June 24th at the Supreme Court to say before the world and all the TV cameras that the Constitution does not confer a right to abortion, Roe and Casey are overruled. It was an amazing moment to be there and a realization that we continued to be faithful to our mission that we were called to, continue to lay out that vision for our entire generation and look at where we are today. Just look at where we are today. It's a whole new conversation, a whole new landscape for our pro-life movement. And I don't, I don't share this story to brag with you about my fancy fundraiser at the Harvard Club or the fact that I had to get dressed up in high heels, which were red, um, or that I was at the Supreme Court the day Roe versus Wade was reversed. I don't sh share that for, for that credit. Um, I share it because I want to leave you all, most of you here in this room are Catholic or Christian, pro-life, um, with some words of wisdom of what we need to do now, where we need to move forward, what we need to do, and how we become an unstoppable force. How this generation 
continues the momentum of row and Doe's reversal into the next phase of our movement so we can accomplish our ultimate vision in America of abolishing abortion. And the key to becoming this unstoppable force, it's stupid simple. It's be gritty and always move forward. Because it's certain, it's absolutely certain that you will face setbacks and we will face defeat just like our pro-life movement did for 49 years in our quest to see Roe reversed. Since launching Students for Life, I can, a whole list comes to my mind from the past 16 and a half years of professional and personal setbacks that I have witnessed and endured. When my son and my daughter's diagnosis of cystic fibrosis, learning that you know, every day I have with them, literally every day I have with my children is, is special and it's a gift. And realizing the time away from them, the time I, I have to leave them, like to come to Fargo, North Dakota in January, <laughs> wasn't thinking that through. But that, that time away from them better be spent on my life's mission to save lives because there's no other reason you would get me away from them. There's been other moments, losing what today seems like not like a big deal, but the time it did, losing grants, losing funding and economic downturns, vital funds that we knew we needed to accomplish and to move forward our strategic goals of starting and sustaining a pro-life generation on college and high school campuses. Um, to the tragedy we, we found ourselves in when we lost two of our team members, Courtney and John, and Courtney's 21-week-old uh, preborn daughter, Sophie, to the actions of one self selfish drunk driver, to the small setbacks that we face, like me thinking I have a great idea that then falls flat and is not successful due to my own human weakness or inability to get the job done, to finish the job, or the, you know, the petty hurtful attacks that can be written about my daughter, uh, my boys, my family, myself uh, from the pro-abortion and sometimes the pro-life trolls online. By the way, you can be overweight and still be pro-life. That's the number one comment I get. It's very fascinating from very diverse people and inclusive people. Um, then I just eat a donut and take a picture of me eating a donut <laughs> and then put it in. Uh, you gotta know how to deal with it, right? I've learned though through all of this, the real gift that God gave me, that prepared me for this moment, because this is funny. I mean, this is like funny stuff. I'm a girl from West Virginia, with no political connections. My parents were, my whole family was Democrats until I got involved in the pro-life movement and I made them all switch their party registration. I can tell that's a whole nother speech title um, later. You can be a Democrat and be pro-life, you're welcome, but <clears throat> we know the party that gets is getting the job done. Anyway, but like, I, I don't come from like this political family. I wasn't raised to like run a human rights nonprofit. It was only just like a couple years ago that my dad stopped asking me, when are you gonna go get a real job and become a lawyer? He just finally figured it out. Um, so I wasn't like raised with like a special gifting that like, ooh, you're gonna lead all of these amazing human beings that are gonna be much, much more gifted than you are. And you're gonna, you're gonna get to lead all of them. <laughs> there's no like, there's no training for that. So I always think about these things when we're at the National Pro-Life Summit this weekend and there's 2,000 young people, college, high school students, sold out the most amazing human beings you will ever meet. Some of you are in the room. And it, I just find it so awe-inspiring for myself of how did I get to this point? How did God put me into this position? Because it, I don't know. It's because of a yes. It was a yes here and a yes here. But it wasn't like I got these amazing skills. My debate skills are probably mediocre at best. 
yes, I have a willingness to allow people to scream at me. People who don't understand where babies come from like to scream at me that I'm anti-science. Yes, I allow them to do that, and I do it with a straight face, and people on the interwebs enjoy watching those exchanges. Um, I don't think it's my intellect. I mean, I got a 4.0, I was Victorian, but I mean, it was like a high school. It's like easy when you think about it. It's certainly not my sense of style. I dress all in black because I've just given up trying. Uh, I figured out black always looks good. You never know what I'm wearing. It's not my like vibrant social media personality. I found out this weekend that I'm viral on TikTok. I don't even have a freaking TikTok. <laughs> I didn't even know. Like they were showing me in the green room. They're like, oh yeah, this is like two million views. I have no idea. So it's not like I have like these special like giftings. I'm like, oh yeah, this qualifies Kristen for this position. When I think about like when it all boils down to why me and why me now, what what have, what gifting has God given me that's so different from anything anybody else? Because trust me. There's a lot of gifts he didn't give me that I would have loved to have. I think the gift that I've been given is this ability to move forward. This ability to quickly pivot and stubbornly refuse to quit when it gets tough, when it gets hard, when it becomes emotionally painful. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, sometimes always being in a forward motion, like always in drive, always pushing to do more, to save more babies, to change more minds, it can be a blessing and it can also be a curse. It can be a curse because I don't, I've been told that I don't stop and smell the roses or celebrate the victories along the way or thank enough people for all the incredible work. I'm always like, great, good job. Now we gotta do this. And everyone's like, I just want a break. I want a cake. I want to celebrate. You should have seen me the day Roe was reversed. There was no celebration. The, it, the next day we were out door knocking, educating community members about nonviolent resources available in the community. I don't remember certain things, like amazing things that happened to me. The young people that came up to me at you know the walk the march for life or the summit with incredible life testimonies who were touched by a video that i didn't even know was on TikTok was out there then you know the atheist this young woman who came up to me was like i wasn't pro-life i'm an atheist but i saw your video and i changed your mind and i even came with a church group to get here today it was great uh, i looked at the church group and i was like yeah you're, you've got some support to do like I don't remember. I mean, the only reason I remember that story is because it just happened on Sunday or Saturday. I'll forget it by next week. I don't remember what my kids' first words were. I remember being there. I remember being excited, but I don't remember. I have four kids. Now, Grant, like, there's lots of stuff going on in my house. But I just don't remember those things. Why? Because I'm always in a forward motion. I'm always thinking about what's next. It's a blessing. In the sense that when I fail, trust me, I can fail big, I don't dwell on it. I begin again. I retool the approach. I try to incorporate the lessons I've learned from my initial failure to try not to do them again. Sometimes I know I have to just you know, drop a project. It's not turning out the way I envisioned it. It's not getting funded by supporters the way I think it needs to be funded. And I just lack the capacity or you know, the skills to properly execute my vision. I, and I know when I say all this, it's like, you're like, you came all the way to Fargo to tell us the secret is moving forward. It doesn't sound like a big deal when you say it out loud, I know. But I truly do think it's one of those things that makes me special. Each and every one of us has, and you know what your special things are. Each and every one of us has something special that we have a talent, a passion, something that's been placed in our heart. Mine is this. I'm a bossy son of a bitch who keeps moving forward. <laughs> and I'm okay with it. I'm 37. I'm comfortable in my body. I'm okay with it. As a result of this, the result of this passion that I have, this trait, 
uh, the team I'm honored to say we've built at Students for Life is unafraid to fail forward. Now, we are the most competitive people you will ever meet. Don't get me wrong. You do not want to play me in a game of monopolies, per my mother. We are very competitive. But our guiding decision making and the choices we make, we, we ask ourselves these questions of will we convert more activists? Will we train more pro-life young people? And can we then engage them in fights we know we must engage in, even if we don't win in those fights? Even if we don't win in those fights. He can film it. He can film everything. I'm famous on the internet. <laughs> we fight to save lives. We fight to change culture. Not but. When we do that, we don't simply do it to put a check in the wind column. And it does make us different from other, other groups who serve. Because there are some who are unwilling to act unless they know a W will be produced or will compromise against themselves and the lazy politicians when we know we should have the votes for something significant. And they say, well, you know, the politicians... They say, you know, we could pass a Life of Conception Act, but it would be a whole lot easier to pass a Heartbeat Act. Really? Why did we compromise against ourselves? We have the majority. Because I know engaging in those fights with tens of thousands of people fighting, we actually are winning. Every defeat attempting to pass a piece of legislation that we have at a state house produces minds changed. New state legislation, new legislative champions created. We literally are the definition of failing forward. And that's what you must do as well. You can fail forward too. This guy's failing backwards, but you can fail forward. <laughs> So that's it. That's my fancy, eloquent wisdom for you, Christian young people of America, to get out there and just do it. And stay there when it gets tough. Stay there when weirdos come in and start filming you. Because there's a lot of things we have to do now that we've entered a post row America. There's a lot. Every day it feels like there are things coming at us from all sides. The extremist Biden administration throws their weight around using the DOJ, weaponizing our DOJ and our FDA to ram down our throats chemical abortion pills. Yes, so what? There's no abortion facilities in North Dakota. Abortions are still happening here. And if Joe Biden has its way, Every woman in North Dakota will have access to chemical abortion pills via the mail, via the local pharmacy. And those pills are four times more dangerous than surgical abortions, 10 times more deadly than surgical abortions. 15% of the time, there's an incomplete rate, failure rate of those abortions, which actually makes the abortion industry more money because then she has to go in and have an abortion. And oh, by the way, they're harming our environment. Because when a woman's suffering a natural miscarriage and she goes to the ER, she's told to use a red bag or a yellow bag catch kit if she doesn't choose to undergo a DNC to remove that dead child. Why? Because our medical professionals know you can't just flush down human remains down a toilet. Hell, in some places, you can't flush down a goldfish down the toilet, but across America today, she's being told to flush her baby down the toilet. And if she doesn't want to do that, there's a little pack of acid being shipped with her with the pills from the chemical abortion cartel in Mexico, as detailed by the Washington Post in October 2022. You can Google it, sweetie. You can take the acid and you can dissolve your baby and then bury your baby in your backyard. By the way, if you were to have a natural miscarriage and do that, you would get in trouble. 
Why? Because you can't just bury human beings anywhere you want. You can't just flush human beings down the toilet. And when a woman ingests dangerous chemical abortion pills, there's chemically tainted blood and tissue that remains. It goes into our waterways. The NIH produced studies have proved are known endocrine disruptors for our fish, our aquatic life, and animals. So if you want environmental justice, you will be anti-chemical abortion pills. If you are pro-chemical abortion pills, you are pro-harming our environment. They left. <laughs> oh, back onto the regular continued program. <laughs> anyway, they really don't like that. They really don't like it because the left uses environmental justice as their way off and time and time again to push through their agenda. And when you ask them very simple question as to why is medical waste organs, why are organs drilled two feet down under in bedrock when they're disposed of, but babies are flushed in our toilets? Why is it that you're not allowed to flush goldfish in our toilets, but you're allowed to flush babies in our toilets? This, it's not a baby. What is it? Simple answer. But we are up against the lot. The Biden administration isn't going to stop. They are extremists. They will not stop in their quest. And I know it's exciting. You're like, yes, North Dakota is abortion facility free. So what? Abortions are still happening here. You all don't have a law on the books to prevent these dangerous chemical drugs from coming in. You don't have a law on the books. Your trigger law is held up in court from one elected judge, which I would think you can remedy that situation, North Dakotans. But I'm not allowed to. Hmm. Interesting. I'm anti-slavery, sir. Are you pro-slavery? Are you pro-slavery, sir? Anti-choice to do what? What am I anti the choice of? Come and ask me questions. I used to be a blob. Does that mean I didn't matter, sir? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of things we can say to that, but I'm glad he got his opinion out. Now you can stop talking and listen maybe for a little bit, and then you can ask questions. You said your piece. You call me a neo-fascist. Go ahead. Now you're done. Now you can listen, and then you can come back with questions later. Well, your school can remove you for not paying attention to rules, but okay, keep going. So anyway, we have a lot to do because there's people like this guy who think they can bully you who go on social media when you post something pro-life, or you know if you have a pro-life bumper sticker with standing with you, our comprehensive resource website that we have at Students for Life, where any woman, not a pregnant person, any pregnant woman or a man who impregnated her can go and get support no matter where they are in the country. 100% confidential support. But you get nasty things written on your car. Nasty comments on social media. We have a complicit mainstream media who takes the fear mongering and the lies and the anti science, antiquated, misogynistic beliefs of this man and then puts them into print. Puts them into print and tells women that they aren't strong enough, tells women that they aren't strong enough to choose both, that they have to make a false choice between the life of their child and their education, or their career and education, that they're not strong enough and smart enough to choose both, when we know they are. And by the way, that we in the pro-life movement have established an entire social safety net of resources of more than 3,000 pregnancy centers and maternity homes that vastly outnumber the fewer than 600 abortion facilities in America today. That in fact, when every single Planned Parenthood in America is shut down for being the racist jerks that they are, 
Every fairly qualified health center will only have to see two more patients a week to make up the difference. And by the way, those fairly qualified health centers offer way more services than Planned Parenthood. Do you know Planned Parenthood only treats, according to their annual report, 18% of the STDs that they diagnose? Do you know where they refer her or him when they're diagnosed with STD? To a fairly qualified health center. You can go to findahealthcenter.hersa.gov, put in your zip code, and be connected to a community health clinic that will actually treat STDs. That will actually have to treat every trauma every illness you present them with and if they don't have the specialty there in the clinic they're legally obligated to get the care you deserve that's the facts we need to combat that is what we need to be promoting and sharing with young people across the country don't let one weirdo with a camera come in here and tell you you're a bully or a neo-fascist when I'm pretty darn sure they're the fascists because they want to shut down conversation. They want to shut down debate. And they're the ones that feel like that they are all powerful, mighty, and get to determine who lives and who dies based on their location, based on their age, based on their genetic differences, based on their parentage. These people think they get to choose who lives and who dies. Sounds like fascism to me. Don't let them bully you. Don't let them bully you into silence. Persuade you to being silent because now is a time we need you more than ever before. And you may not know every hard answer that gets thrown your way or you may feel like, I don't know, you know everything Kristen says. Guess what? You don't have to. All you need to be is a kind, loving person who's willing to have that conversation. And if you don't know the answer, you can say, you know what? I don't know. Let me think about this and let me get back to you with a fact-filled answer. Let me go look up the stats and I'll get back to you. You can do that too. Because on our computers, we can be pro-life activists. On our campuses, we can be pro-life activists. In our churches, we can be pro-life activists. It's actually anti-abortion, sir. I'm anti-abortion, which makes you pro-abortion. So if you want to get technical, I'll use anti-abortion, but you go ahead. Start saying pro-abortion. Go ahead. Pro-abortion. Pro-abortion person. Yep. Mm -hmm. So on the computer, on the Capitol, in the community, on the campus, you can be an anti-abortion activist. And there's a lot we can do. Chemical abortion, let's look at the top 10 lies of the abortion industry. Get ready, he's gonna get really pissed. <laughs> First one, I know the mid, poor Midwestern kids, you all are like, oh, it's okay, I lived in Minnesota for four years, I get it, it's okay. You're gonna watch me do it, and you'll be like, oh my gosh, I can never do it. That's okay, you don't have to do this. Just know, your little debates on Facebook or Instagram, you don't do Facebook, I'm too old. On Instagram or TikTok, they're never like this, so don't worry, it only gets better. So let's do the top 10 myths of what you need to rebut. Whether you're at the Capitol, whether you're here, whether you're online, let's go through. First one, chemical abortion is safe. That does a lie, as I, shared with you earlier, it's four times more dangerous, 10 times higher death rate, 15% of chemical abortions are actually incomplete and she will have to go in for a surgical abortion to remove parts of the baby or the placenta so she doesn't die of sepsis. You don't have to take my word for it. You can go to any pregnancy chat room in America, not a pro-life chat room, and just start reading the comments of pro-choice women who will share their stories of horror about chemical abortion. At thisischemicalabortion.org, we compiled 70 pages of just chat room comments that women were f women, because only women have abortions, because only women have uteruses. But women were sharing comments about their chemical abortion. These comments were devastating. 
women saying, you know, I don't regret my abortion, I'm pro-choice, but I had to come on here and tell you why not to have a chemical abortion. I have to tell you how bad the experience was and how I kept feeling like I was going to die and nobody paid attention to me. Chemical abortion is not safe. It leads to injury, infertility, and death, and is the drug of choice for sex abusers across our country. And we already know this. Men across our country continue to act, access chemical abortion pills illegally, and they put them in women, their, their wives or their girlfriends in women's tea in drinks. She has what she believes is a natural miscarriage until they test and find out she has drugs in her bloodstream for chemical abortion pills. Making these drugs over the counter, which is the ultimate goal of the abortion industry, the only thing holding them back right now, why these drugs aren't over the counter, why the Biden administration has just said pharmacies may distribute, the only reason they're not over the counter yet, folks, is because Planned Parenthood hasn't figured out how to replace their abortion income yet. But when they do, it took less than four years for a Plan B, which is a contraceptive drug, which can kill an early embryo. The intention is not to kill an early embryo, but it can. It took less than four years from pharmacies being able to dispense it to it being over the counter. We must stop chemical abortion pills. We cannot get to a point in our country where you're at the store, ladies, buying tampons, or you men are there buying the tampons for the woman you love in your life, which you should, and the girl in front of you is getting ready to ingest a pill to end the life of her child. Or the rapist behind you is getting ready to poison his next victim. We cannot allow that normalization of abortion to occur in our culture. Chemical abortion is not safe. The second lie we often hear that you have to dispel. Women need abortion to succeed. Pro-abortion people feel like women need access to a government-funded special surgery in order to be equal to men. I'm a little bit of a feminist on this point. Women can gestate, we can menstruate, which sometimes we curse, and we can lactate, which freaks out my children. <laughs> we can do three things that men can never do. So I would argue that men should kind of want to be like us. We do not need special surgery in order to end the life of our child in order to be like the heteronormative male body. No, thank you. And we are strong enough. It is the opposite of empowerment to tell a woman she must kill her child, a living whole human being residing within her a little girl or little boy that child must die in order for her to succeed that's the definition of poverty in our country it's misogyny to tell a woman she should choose abortion because you know what it's easier on them it's easier on the men who impregnate her and they can leave her in pain and leave her to have to parent their child. I am very much pro forcing men to pay child support at the moment of conception. It would clear up a lot of deadbeats in our country. Third, going off script. Third, I had a whole motivational talk plan for you, so I'm just staying Virginia and some apologetics. We'll end with motivation. Don't worry, I'll get there. Third, just a clump of cells. Yes, a preborn child is just a clump of cells, just like how I'm a clump of cells. Why is there no legal movement to d kill me? Because of my location, because of my size, because of my age, and oh, because my dad didn't rape my mom. That's the only difference. There is no fundamental difference between the embryo or the zygote, or if you want to use clump of cells that you once were, than the clump of cells you are today. You are exactly the same person with unique genetic 
code that has never existed before and will never exist again. And you know when that genetic code came into being? It's when your father's sperm entered the ovum, the egg, and pow, life began. That is a moment that 96% of biologists agree life begins. Now everybody gets all mad saying, you can't just tell me when life begins. No, science is definitive, that's when life begins. The argument that they have is that that life doesn't have value. That's the argument that they're failing to make, but they're really trying to make. Because it is undisputable that human life begins at conception. Because guess what? Dead things don't grow. A child inside of a mother's body cannot be dead. It's growing in a coordinated fashion. It's actually developing its own organs. It's self-directed. Her body doesn't even tell her son's body how to grow. It's not dead. It's living. I cannot make a qual bear. I want a qual bear so bad. I have Googled for end hour, like how to hold a qual bear. I go to San Diego. I know a guy who works at the zoo. I'm going to make it happen. Or I'm going to Australia. But I, no matter how many times I have sex, no matter what position I have sex with my husband in, I know there's priests here and it's getting really uncomfortable. I'm not making eye contact with them. <laughs> I cannot get pregnant with a koala bear. It's just not possible. Why? Because the law of biogenesis says like begets like. Human only can reproduce human. So we know what's inside of her is a human because it's not a koala bear. I've tried. And we know it's not dead because it's growing and it's alive. So what is it? It's a unique, whole, living human being that's never existed before and will never exist again. That's what's inside of her. So it's not just merely a clump of cells. Fourth, Planned Parenthood cares about women. Oh, this is my favorite. Planned Parenthood nation's trusted health care. Until Black Lives Matter discovered what we knew all along and that Planned Parenthood's own founder was a racist and eugenicist. And then everyone's like, well, that was different. Margaret Sanger came of age in the early 1900s and every white person was a racist. Well, my family was one of those ones that came over from Ireland to Poland that she wanted to sterilize because we were the unfit immigrants. So, no. Not everybody was racist, by the way. But it's funny because for years the pro-life movement would say this. Like, hey, did you know Margaret Sanger spoke at a female auxiliary KKK rally? Hey, did you know the Nazis came here to America in the 1920s and learned about eugenics? And people go, that's crazy. You can't say that stuff. You're white. You're not allowed to talk about racism. Smart tactic. But then Black Lives Matter suddenly discovered the thing we knew all along. The Margaret Sanger was a racist, spoke openly about how we needed to get to the Negro population and use ministers to convince them why they needed birth control, why they needed sterilization. It's called negative eugenics. But then there was like, oh, NYU suddenly took down all of Margaret Sanger's writings. They used to be online. How I wish I had screenshotted that. No, they're at NYU, sweetie. I just can't get to them because they know every time I screenshot them, they go public. Um, but yeah, so no, Black Lives Matter figures out Planned Parenthood's racist. Everyone's like, yeah, well, you know, they're a little racist, but they're not all the way racist. And, you know, they're pro-abortion, so that makes them an okay level of racist. But if they were pro-life, like, we would totally cancel them. Oh, okay. Planned Parenthood is a predatory, vicious model. Planned Parenthood is like hiring the tobacco lobby to go into our schools and tell kids not to smoke. It's like having Philip Morris go in and be like, hey, run a little program. Tell the kids that like smoking pollutes their lungs and get lung cancer. That's what happens. Planned Parenthood in many school systems across our country is hired to go into our school systems to tell our kids how to stay safe during sex. But yet they're the agency that makes money when they do have sex. 
And then when they have sex, and then they get an STD, which by the way, we're in an STD epidemic in our country. Don't have sex outside of marriage, it's gross. Yeah, that doesn't make too much sense, does it? And then when she really gets in trouble, beyond just, you know, gentle words, don't Google that, uh, or chlamydia or something like that, then when she gets pregnant, she goes back to them as well. It's a predatory model that they've developed a relationship with her when she was 10 years old. They beat us to the punch. Yeah, Planned Parenthood's not about helping women. You can see in their own annual reports talking about sources. No one gets more excited for Planned Parenthood's annual report than Students for Life of America. They always release it on a Friday night when things are busy. This year, it was a Friday after Queen Elizabeth died, so nobody was paying attention. But we were. Every single year for the past hmm, 10 years, their good services, you know that reason we have to keep funding them, those good services, continues to decline. Adoption referrals, STD treatment referrals, STD tests, breast cancer screenings. Guess what? They were all trending downward. Guess what went up the past few years? And the only thing that went up at Planned Parenthood, abortions and abortion funding. Oh, this one's, this one's fun. Myth that you're going to have a lot of fun, men online talking about this. It's going to be your favorite subject. Hormonal birth control. Here's a myth. Hormonal birth control doesn't cause abortions. You're crazy. It does. It can. The back of the Plan B box actually says it. On the left side of the black, you can Google it in Google Images right now. On the back side of the Plan B box, Plan B, which is a 10 times more powerful dose than the normal birth control pill, by the way. Plan B, the goal of Plan B is to stop an egg from being released from the woman's ovary. Therefore, conceptions can't occur, okay? That's how life happens. Just making sure we all know that. Because some of us probably don't. So, what happens? What's an alternative backup method to plan B and other hormonal birth control? It also makes the uterine lining, lining inhospitable to a fertilized egg slash embryo slash zygote. You can Google the word fertilized egg and it's not zygote. The only reason the left uses the word fertilized egg, why? Because it dehumanizes the new person. It makes it seem like it's not a person. We say fertilized egg as if it's still a part. No, actually it's not, because once the egg from mom gets fertilized by sperm from dad, it's unique whole living human being. So in the back of the Plan B box, on the left-hand side, it says a big, bold font, will not harm existing pregnancy. On the right-hand side, a teeny, tiny font says, may prevent implantation of a fertilized egg. How can they legally get away with this, you ask this question? Well, it goes back to 1965 when the American College of OBGYNs uh, the number two most liberal lobbyist for abortion in America today after Planned Parenthood changed the definition of pregnancy from the moment when egg and sperm united and a new human being was created to implantation of that human being into the uterine wall. And you want to know why they changed the definition of pregnancy? To allow for contraception and IVF. So we can say, we're not killing any babies. We're just flushing them out. Uh, and, you know, Plan B can do it. We know birth control can do it because Plan B is only 10 times more powerful than normal birth control. And we all know someone who is on a birth control pill who got pregnant. So we know the birth control pill is not 100% at preventing eggs from being released from the ovaries, which is the intended effect. It does it about 90% of the time, 90, 91% of the time. I would not have gotten on a plane here today. Now, granted, I got on an old, old plane. But I would not have gotten on a plane today if I thought there was a 9% annual failure rate of that American Airlines plane. I just wouldn't have done it. But we accept it. Uh, next uh, myth. Women can be men. No. <laughs> you can't. And this, this is not a call to... Um, this is not a call to be mean. It is not a call to make fun of our brothers and sisters who are confused and struggling with their gender identity. But I think it's harmful and uncaring when we don't tell people the truth. That no, men cannot be women. You know what I mentioned earlier about why chemical abortion pills still aren't over the counter? That's because Planned Parenthood, which today is the second largest provider of wrong sex hormone treatment, hasn't fully perfected their, their empire yet. 
But their next cash cow is wrong sex hormone treatment, which actually, if you think about the eugenics past of Planned Parenthood, fulfills their objectives even purer. Because what Planned Parenthood wanted, and what Margaret Sanger found, Margaret Sanger actually wasn't pro-abortion. She actually was against abortion. Planned Parenthood, I have a first from 1962 from Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood saying no abortion is murder. Planned Parenthood was founded to make sure unfit people can't reproduce. Because Margaret Sanger thought that was one of the greatest challenges America faced was that, you know, people of color, stupid people, immigrants were reproducing. It was producing all these imbeciles across it. That's the third term. Imbeciles. So their goal was eugenics, sterilization, birth control, prevent the births from happening in the first place. Wrong sex hormone treatment actually fulfills that agenda way, way faster. Because, yes, chemical abortions can make you infertile, especially if you're RH negative and you don't get a blood test. 15% of our population is RH negative. If you're RH negative and you have an abortion and you don't know you're RH negative, you may never be able to carry another child to term again. That's why you always have to get a blood test when you find out when you're pregnant, says the man who actually hasn't had kids. But okay. But sterilization is achieved at a much faster rate with wrong sex hormone treatment, which no one is talking about. <clears throat> that, those will actually be the lawsuits that shut down Planned Parenthood. Okay, next myth that you have to combat online, on your computer, here, uh, at your capital. Miscarriages and ectopic pregnancy treatment are abortion. No, that's not true. Actually, until August, when we exposed it, Planned Parenthood even said so on their own website. Then when it went public, they changed their website to purposely be confusing and to play into a narrative. But it has never been thought of that removing a child who has died from a woman's uterus is not considered a direct abortion. It's considered a therapeutic abortion. There's no beating heart. There's no developing child. The intention is fundamentally different. And that topic pregnancy is a life-threatening condition. This is actually why women, before they have an abortion, this is why women, before they have a chemical abortion, should be required to see a doctor, which, by the way, the Biden administration says she shouldn't. Because if she's experiencing a topic pregnancy, the pregnancy test will come back positive. She'll start having cramps, thinking it's the first pregnancy, and she can die because her fallopian tu tube can burst. Ectopic pregnancy is when the child, remember when I talked about egg being released here in the ovary, and then sperm usually meets it up here in the fallopian tube. Life is created, and then the egg travels down. Everyone, all the men are like totally grossed out. Then the egg travels down to the mother's uterus and plants into the uterine wall. In ectopic pregnancy, the egg gets stuck. The egg, the new child gets stuck in the fallopian tube. And the child implants into the fallopian wall. As of right now, with our medical technology, we have no way of saving that child. I know some doctors that are trying to find ways to remove the child from the fallopian tube, insert the child into the uterine wall. We, can't, we don't have medical technology right now to save the life of the child. But we do know if we don't operate, two people will die and not just one. That is not a direct abortion. And it is the outrage of outrage that the abortion lobby will lie and deceive and scare women across our country into thinking that if she's dying, if she's experiencing life-threatening ectopic pregnancy, that we don't care, that we want her to die. When literally there's no pro-life law that's ever been written that says that she, she would die. None. Absolutely none. Next slide. Pro-lifers don't care about women. I went over this. We, in the 49 years while waiting for Rotary to be reversed, have set up an entire social safety net of pregnancy centers, maternity homes, that do way more than Planned Parenthood would even pretend to do. Like, they actually have actual ultrasounds. There's more than 3,000 of them across the country. You can go to Students Wives on website, standingwithyou.org, put in your zip code. For yourself, your friend, get resources, public and private places of support, nonviolent health care. It's absolutely false to say pro-lifers don't care about women when we're the ones who get up at 6 in the morning and go pray in front of the abortion facility and offer alternatives and give brochures. 
We absolutely are the ones to do that. We fund pregnancy centers, hundreds of thousands, actually hundreds of millions of dollars every year we're donating to pregnancy centers across the country. It is categorically false to say that pro-lifers don't care about women. It's just a talking point and it's nothing else and it's completely unfounded. On the next slide, this is kind of funny because you all are religious. Uh, all pro-lifers are religion, religious. They're actually not. And they remind me that all the time. Every time I say something that's sort of Christian, then I get a nice email from an atheist pro-lifer telling me, remind, remind you I exist. We know they exist. We see you. We welcome you. But no, not all pro-lifers are religious. If you ask many pro-life students for life leaders across the country why they are in this fight, uh, they will not say it's because God tells them to or because my Sunday school said so. They'll say, no, it's, duh, it's human rights. I knew when my mom was pregnant with my sister that what was inside her was, was a baby. And I was astounded by the fact that some people think those babies should be ripped apart, should have drugs administered into their heart to give them a cardiac arrest. And we should call that freedom. We should say yeah, that's legal. So no, not all pro-lifers are religious. Uh, the last one, uh, last lie that you have to rebut. My body, my choice. Now, let me just start off the simple fact. When I was pregnant with my three boys, did I become a man? There were male genitalia floating around in my uterus, but did that make me a man? It's really funny how people say, her body, her choice, and they're the same people that say the men can get pregnant. It's a little funny. Let's just stick with one thing. Pick your side. But no, I did not become a man when I was pregnant with my boys, even though there was male DNA inside of me. Right? Clearly, when I'm pregnant, when you become pregnant, there's another body in your body. Now, do women have autonomy over their bodies? Do we believe that? Yeah. We all believe each and every one of us has autonomy over our bodies. We don't want generally people going around saying, hey, you should smoke this cigar. No, thanks. No, you really shouldn't. No, I don't want to. Leave me alone. It's gross. It's bad for you, too. Oral cancer is disgusting. Don't do it. But you have autonomy to say that. What we say in the pro-life movement, though, is when your rights begin to end when they trample on someone else's. It's like really simple. Like in the Declaration, our founders said life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now I know our vice president this Sunday left off. She said liberty and pursuit of happiness and literally left off life. And she also left off the part where the, the founders said they were God given rights. She said it was a promise we made to each other. I'm pretty sure like some people in this room wouldn't want me to have that. That, that promise of life. So I'm really glad God gave me that. But anyway, in the declaration, what it actually says, not what the vice president says, we have God-given rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And it's very clear why you say life, then liberty, then pursuit of happiness. With abortion, you have a conflict of rights. You have a mother's liberty at stake, and you have a baby's life at stake. And the rights are conflicting with each other. For 49 years, we've been told, oh, her liberty supersedes your life. Really? Think about that in American history. Think about it in world history. Does really my liberty give me the right to end someone else's life? Does my pursuit of happiness or a profit at my, I don't know, plantation, give me the right over someone else's liberty? Mm, no. And in every single instance in our collective human history, we've disordered those three fundamental rights. Terrible, bad things happen. It's never good. It's never good. So when it comes to abortion, it's very simple. Yes, she has a right to liberty. Yes, she has a right to bodily autonomy. But your right stops when it stops the right to life another human being. We believe in the pro-life movement 
that she is capable of sacrificing nine months so someone else can live 90. I'm not saying it's easy. No one in the pro-life movement, most of us are women who've had babies. None of us are saying that's an easy decision or an easy choice to make. But we're saying she's capable of it. And we've set up a whole social safety net to help her along the way. Because we can't be disordering rights. Fundamentally, each and every one of us has the right to life. And if that right to life gets taken away from us, then we live in a fascist state. When an elite few dressed in flannels and weird snowshoes get to decide who has the right to life and who doesn't. That doesn't end well, guys. No matter how you fall on the ideological you know, perspective, the religious background, it's not going to end well. So no, it's not just her body, her choice. So now I've gone through basically every hard question you'll get. It wasn't that bad. Now is your charge to be unstoppable. Being unstoppable, let me remind you, does not mean you are not going to fail. It means you're not going to quit. When bullies come in to harass you, whether it's here, whether it's online, whether it's in the workplace, you are the only person who can cancel yourself. Being unstoppable means you're determined. And I think it's important that when we, I know sometimes when I speak to collectively, you know, religious audiences, pro-lifers, I can hear a lot of folks say, I want to do this, or I've thought about doing this, but I almost hear the hesitancy in your voices. I think when we talk and we engage and we launch projects, even if they fail, I truly believe we continue to educate people about the truth about the violence of abortion and the dignity of every human being. Your failed projects, what you think might be a failed effort, actually still sow seeds. You literally hold the seeds to abolishing abortion in your hands. Don't be afraid. Just throw them out there. In Jesus' parable, some will fall on thorns, but others are going to fall on fertile ground and they're going to take root. But the challenge for you is don't sit there and look at the seeds in your hand and say, oh, this one may land in fertile ground. This one I'm not so sure about. If you do that, you'll delay. You'll talk yourself out of good ideas. You'll evaluate, reevaluate, reevaluate, have like 20 meetings about it. Then the time to act will be passed. The moment to it, you know, change minds, to speak into a broader news cycle, to get people on the news thinking, that will, that will pass you by. So I think the challenge for us is we have all of these things we can be doing, throw them out there. Try new things. Don't hold anything back. Because if you hold them in your hand anyway, by the way, do you know seeds are considered living organisms? But pro aborts won't argue with me on that one. But if you hold seeds in your hand, they're going to die anyway. They're going to die. They're not going to be watered. There's no photosynthesis, whatever, going on. They're going to die. So try new things. Try it. Even if you're like, ah, I don't know if I'm going to like that. I don't know how successful I'm going to be at praying in front of abortion facility or becoming a sidewalk advocate or investigating Red River Women's Clinic for harming women or going to the state capitol to lobby for legislation to protect women and children from the predatory abortion industry. But try it. Throw the seeds out there. See where, they, see where they fall. See where they stick. Don't be the evaluators of a potential yield. Be the sower of the seeds to produce the yield. Because ultimately, someone's going to come along and water that seed, even if it's not you. 
ultimately the cumulative impact of hundreds of thousands of people every day throwing the seeds out there, doing everything we can, everything we can think of, every new inventive gritty idea we can think of to change minds and to save women and children from the violence of abortion, of doing the right thing over and over and over again, it's going to yield a harvest. It's going to yield a harvest for sure. I've met the harvest this weekend before I forget. I wrote down their stories. I met the harvest. At the pro-life summit, I had um, a, a girl who was 11 years old, Juanita, come up to me from Perrysburg, Ohio, and she asked me if I would be the 137th signer on her letter to President Joe Biden. She hand wrote a letter to the president asking why he wasn't living up to his Catholic faith. And then handed me a little 40 days for life pen and said, will you be the number 137 signer? Apparently she was walking around my summit, didn't pay for a vendor pass, uh, and she was asking other people to sign up too. It was so amazing. I had a, I had a young girl who had never been to anything in the pro life movement before, who I think kind of got drugged there by her school from the Archdiocese in the Twin Cities, who came to the summit, our National Pro-Life Summit, which was the day after, and came up to me and she goes, I'm going to start a pregnancy center as soon as I graduate college. That's it. That's my calling in life. That girl's throwing her seeds out there. I don't know if she's going to be successful, but she's throwing them out there. Juanita, 11-year-old little Juanita, who a bit later when I said, do you want my job? And she said, yes. Who's going to take my job one day? I need to get another job. Um, she's throwing it all out there. I'm 11 years old. The atheist, the young atheist I met from Charlottesville who braved the ride with the church group to come to the March for Life to hold her cute atheist pro-life sign. She's throwing it all out there. All of them. So I challenge you today, don't be afraid of the bullies. Don't be afraid of what they say to you online or the passive aggressive post notes they stick on your car in the park Target parking lot. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to be unstoppable. Challenge yourself. That no matter your failures, your setbacks, embrace the law of probability, people. I'm pro stats. Embrace the law of probability. You, some of your seeds are just going to pale. But to be okay, because collectively we're going to yield a harvest that moves forward in this post row America until we get to a country where abortion is unthinkable and unavailable. That's only going to happen if you all are unstoppable in your quest, unstoppable in your education, whether it's on the computer slash phone, whether it's at the state capitol, whether it's here on campus, whether it's in the community, whether it's at your church and parish, you have to continue to throw out those seeds and be unafraid. All right, I'll take questions now. You have this question. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they can use the mic. All right, all right, I'll let you guys use the mic. Can we get one more round of applause for Christian Hawkins? I hope someone filmed that. As she said, she was ready to take some of your questions. Um, I'm gonna have you guys line up around this, my right, your left, line up around this side where you see Nathan waving, I'll hand you a microphone. And Kristen will answer your question. Reminder to be respectful, no matter what side you're on. And actually have a question. And actually have a question. <laughs> All right, let's do this. Line up. Yeah, I'll do it without Mike. Okay, are you sure? Yeah. Perfect. Just tell me if you can't hear me. Right. I project. I've been told. <laughs> oh God, yes, an iPad. <laughs> I had to write it down so I didn't forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> wow, that was something. Oh, oh so, <laughs> um, it's hard these days, I guess, as a guy to um, be out here as a pro-life um, 
advocate. Mm -hmm. um, so the last thing, obviously, I want to do is offend my friends, you know, female friends, right? Um, the societal norm of my body, my choice, is a lie that leads to the tragedy that is abortion. We all know that. But no matter how many sources you give people, how many resources you give people, you know, there's, it, rape is a tragedy, it really is. But no matter how many times you tell people, you say there are resources out there, there's women's centers, there's, mm -hmm. you know, you can go to therapy, there's support groups, there's ways to help you, it just doesn't make a difference. So my question is, what advice do you have for my generation to fight the stigma that a woman's body is more valuable than another voiceless human's life? Um, yeah, so I think when you're, you want to get to me? Sure. Say my voice. <clears throat> I'm going to hurt my kids, so it's fine. Um, I think you wanted to ask about sexual assault. Essentially. Essentially. You, okay. Because um, I kind of went over my body, my choice a little bit. I, I realized when I was talking, I didn't go through sexual assault. I think, one, it's important to remember when uh, someone who is pro-abortion or pro-choice um, brings up the issue of rape. Um, I think it's very important that you stop and you uh, show your love and compassion for those who've survived sexual assault. Um, sometimes that question really isn't about abortion, it's about you. And are you this crazy pro-life robot who only has answers, or are you actually a kind, compassionate human being? So I think that's the first thing you have to do is stop, check yourself, um, because, you know, most likely with, the, with sexual assault statistics on campuses, person who's asking that question may have been sexually assaulted themselves, girl or boy. Um, I think the second thing you have to do after that, and especially when you're talking about the question of bodily autonomy, um, I kind of ask the question a lot of times of saying, well, let's just set that aside. So set aside the issue of rape, sexual assault, which is about 1 to 1.5% of all cases of rape, about 5% of women who are sexually assaulted become pregnant. Um, about 50% of them uh, choose life, and the other ones, other 50% choose abortion or adoption. So it's actually not like as high as everyone thinks. Everyone assumes it's like 100%. That's actually not true. So I think it's important to first get that out. But I, but I do like to ask the question of, well, let's, <clears throat> let's set that aside because that's an awful situation. No one ever wants to talk about that. Let's set aside, will you join with me in opposing the 98% of all other abortions. Like, let's let's make sure we agree on that before we get to this really awful subject first. Uh, and no one actually ever says yeah. Someone who's pro-abortion, and when I say that to them, um, they'll instantly go, no, it's, 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 it's different. Okay, yeah, I understand it's different. Let's talk about that differently. Let's first make sure we can get some common ground that we both can agree on, will you agree with me that the other 98% of rapes are wrong and sh should not be? That we should make them unavailable? That we should have resources for women so no woman thinks that they're uh, an option that, that she, can, she can choose? Um, I've actually never had a pro-abortion person on campus agree with me on that fact. Uh, and I think that's really sad because my next question is, why did then, did you choose to exploit the horror of sexual assault in order to justify your extremist view that 100% of abortion should take place in our country. And I think that's the question we need to be asking because for someone who gets asked this question a lot, I am really sick and tired of someone who <clears throat> is 100% pro-abortion, meaning abortion whenever, wherever, taxpayer funded, all nine months, even if it's because the mother doesn't like the gender of the baby, which, by the way, everyone acknowledges gender in the womb. Um, crazy. Um, why is it that we keep coming back to this as this, just, this justification for 100% of all abortions? We're never going to get anywhere. You're never going to get anywhere with that person until you say, let's figure out where we can at least find a common ground of where we agree on. Um, and I think it's terribly disingenuous of those who support abortion. If you support abortion, uh, you should be able to support abortion. You should be able to come up and say, nope, I understand science says it's a human being, it's whole, it's living, and I still think a mom uh, has the right to kill that human being. I don't really have a response to that besides, I think you're wrong. I think that's setting up our society for something deeply dark and tragic, and I will do everything I can to stop you. 
there's no other response to that, right? There isn't a response to someone's like, nope, I know it's a human being, I still think I'd kill it. The best thing we can do is to make sure other people are listening to that. Because sometimes we do have, um, and we will find uh, those who support abortion who are actually genuinely honest about what abortion is. And I think we should amplify those voices because the majority of people, when they hear that, and when they have to process that, beyond all of the like slogans of keep abortion legal, my body, my choice, whatever, that deeply affects them and moves them actually to our position. Um, thank you so much, Kirsten, for speaking and for all the wonderful work you do. Um, my question, I guess, well, I think it's fair to say that anyone who supports abortion or who has had an abortion is just a fundamentally unhappy person. You can take all the people who are there tonight. Um, you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but you can judge a tree by its fruits. And um, the way that they dressed and the words that they said, they just seem like unhappy people who support abortion, probably because they think that it's their only option. Or they're post supportive themselves. Yeah. That, that's. That's something you have to understand is a lot of times people who mean this to you are those who actually have had abortion. And their justification of their treatment towards you is trying to make them themselves feel okay with the choice that they made. Because anyone's ever saying abortion is bad hurts their feelings. Because deep down, it's written in our human heart not to want to kill babies. And so abortion is a retooling of that, and it's hard. For those who then have to justify their um, pro-abortion views over and over again. So. Yes, that brings me to my question, like people who support abortion get so set in the way that they feel, and I find time in my schedule this semester to spend an hour outside of the clinic for prayer and also trying to counsel, um, and so I'm wondering, like, there's only a few fleeting moments from the moment the woman pulls into the parking lot and is escorted by... Yeah demons essentially into the clinic like what can you what can I say when I'm like across the parking lot on the sidewalk when she's already so convinced that this is her only option like what what would you advise anyone just to say in those few fleeting seconds hmm. um do you wear your scrubs I could do that one I would say wear your scrubs We've had, I always encourage doctors to go out and wear their white coats. I think it's, you know, they have a certain, and we've done the research at Students for Life, and the brand of pro-life is not good. What the pro-abortion media, uh, what, who they say we are is not good. And so when, if you're out there, a beautiful young woman in medical scrubs, that is going to, just your mere presence, even if you're just there praying, that's going to jar her because that's all you need, right? You need like a few seconds of hesitancy and so you want her to see you as a peer, as someone who's her age that has other things to do too but is coming out and spending two hours in the freezing cold to be there for her. I think that's really significant. That's why I'm always a big advocate of like, not that I'm ageist, I'm not ageist, we love people of all ages in the pro-life movement and as I get older I'm even less ageist than I was before you know, you know I had systemic ageism um, but it's getting better um, but I think it does something to have her see you guys out there because you're her age she doesn't expect it she expects no offense to the Monsignor and priest she expects the priest she expects the white old guy holding a rosary that's, that's the view that the media has propagated this entire time. And so I think it's important just from like a line of sight, who she's seeing, she, young men as well. She's not expecting to see you out there. So I think you just being there, I think, um, I mean, there's different strategies. I met a guy, I was at dinner, he's a little kooky, um, but he has this amazing technique where he has $20 bills. Uh, it, he saved like 2,500 babies, so who am I to judge? And, but it's, I will pay you $20 if you share your story with me. He, the man has saved like 2,000 babies. It's incredible. And then he goes up, and once he starts talking to her, he'll say, I'll give you 80 more dollars if you go get the ultrasound. 
it's amazing. Like uh, for a hundred bucks, he saves life. Like you can't do that in a pro life. Trust me, I like run digital ads all the time. It cost me like nineteen hundred dollars per baby saved in like twelve cities across America right now. And I'm like, whoa, nine hundred bucks? That's a steal. I mean, really, it is for like a lifetime of a human being. But a hundred bucks? So I'm like gonna be arming some students with like hundred dollar bills, not dollar bills, like hundred dollar bills. I don't know if it's like weird out there, but. Um, I'll try it, but I thought that was an interesting technique where it's like, tell me your story. Even if you don't got the 20 bucks, maybe have a sign say, hey, I want to hear your story. Just tell me. Tell me why you're here. Don't let me talk to you. I think the other thing you can do that I think is really um, also jarring for her is that you're like, I'm going to be here when you come out. That speaks to the argument that that guy was yelling at me for. You don't care about babe, women. You just care about fetuses or whatever. When they're the ones who are fetus phobic. Like they're literally terrified of human fetuses. But when we tell her like, hey, I'm going to be here when you come out too. Like we're still going to be here for you. That's how much we care about you. We care about your baby and you. But even if you go through this decision, I'm still going to be here for you. I think that that's pretty powerful too. Hopefully that helps. As a proud pro-life man. Woo! By the way, to all the men, fellow men here in this room and across the country, it is okay to be pro-life. It is more than okay. We are standing up for what is right. Embrace it and be proud of it. Yes. I know Anyways. you're jealous because you can't menstruate last night, but it's okay. <laughs> Anyways, what should I do when told that I cannot have an opinion on this issue because of my sex? All right. Um, well, I mean, the snarky answer is, you know, arguments don't have gender. People do, and there's only two. Because <laughs> usually the person gets really angry about the last part, and then they, like, acquiesce on that, and then they go, what? Transgender. Um, so it's an interesting diversion technique. Um, but no, it is. It's unbelievable that we say that men don't have an opinion on abortion. But if you're bro choice man, bro choicers, they were out there. Yeah, I got one right now stuck in me. Derek. Derek. I think he has a restraining order against me or something. But he's bro choice, and they're like, women love him. I'm like, whoa, Derek. I'm like, the man's a crazy person. But he's like given these awards and accolades because he thinks if he would ever impregnate a woman, schlepping her to an abortionist so he can escape responsibility of actually being a dad is like a heroic act. I mean, that's what's so depraved about abortion in our culture today because wrong is right and right is wrong and down is up and up is down. That's why we have like a whole generation, no offense, of confused young people who've never actually been told what their bodies are for. The most controversial thing I say on campus should not be, if you don't want to get pregnant, don't have heterosexual sex. That should be like a given, but it's not. So you absolutely do have an opinion. You just have to fight and say, no, I have an opinion. I absolutely have an opinion on this issue because last time I checked, it also takes a man to make a baby. Last time I checked, if I get my girlfriend pregnant, not saying you're having promiscuous sex or anything, you got a Catholic chair on. But if you get your girlfriend pregnant and you don't want her to have a baby, guess what? You're legally obligated and will be put in jail if you don't provide child support. I've actually used that for some bro choice men before, and they're like, that is interesting. I'm like, yeah. So, no, you just, you just have to say no. Like, no. No, I have a say. I have absolutely as much of a say as you have a say when it comes to moral issues that determine the fate of human lives and whether or not they get to live or die. And by the way, who are you for telling me I'm a man and you're gendering me? You don't know me. <laughs> that will really confuse me. I wish I had like more eloquent things to say besides like no, but no. Okay, um, where are the, where are the, where exactly are the stats and links to 
to birth control, abortion, and just the eugenics movement, to physical and mental disabilities like autism, and how can we fight this, like how can we fight this overall movement? Like, what are the stats with disability and abortion mm. and such? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a stat linking abortion to autism in children. There might be. my The source I usually go to, and I usually have like this little white folder that I have for like 10 years. <laughs> you think it'd be more advanced, but it's really not. I have a white folder of studies. And so usually if I'm in a hostile audience, you'll see me at the podium like going through my studies. Um, and I just keep them in my folder. I just add to them every once in a while. They have like crumbs and like kids drawings on them and things like that. But I get them from PubMed. So it's pubmed.nih.gov. It's National Institutes of Health has like this comprehensive database where you can literally go in, you can type abortion, you can type abortion comma autism and Google it to see if there are abortion and autism studies. I have not personally ever searched to see if, the, to see if there's a link for that. Uh, but I can tell you right now, you can go to pubmed.nh.com and put in abortion and you will see a lot of studies. Um, about abortion risk factors. You'll see um, one of the most famous studies is by Priscilla Coleman. She's a professor at Bowling Green University, uh, Bowling Green, Ohio, and she did a comprehensive meta-analysis is where you kind of summarize a bunch of different studies together, um, abortion and mental health that was published in the British Journal of Psychiatry, not a pro-life source, that showed an 81% increased risk of mental health problems of women who had undergone abortion. I often find, to be honest with you, when you're a PubMed, and I don't have my list because I was told this was like, going to be a friendly audience tonight, so I didn't bring my abortion tools or my list. Uh, serves me right. Um, but uh, you can just go on there and you'll actually see the majority of the studies that are done are actually international studies. And I actually trust those studies more than I trust studies here. So fun fact, not so fun, uh, America has no national abortion reporting law. This is one of the biggest things that the pro-life movement needs, but we just never get around to it. We're like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like going to the dentist, like, yeah, 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 I'll do that. And then you wait till you have a cavity. But um, we actually need very badly a national abortion reporting law in our country because we actually don't have valid statistics on abortion. Some states report into the CDC, but it's completely voluntary. Other states report into Guttmacher, which is, named after Guttmacher Institute, which is named after Alan Guttmacher, who was the vice president of the American Eugenics Association. Before it became the American Genetics Association, he was also second president of Planned Parenthood. They used to be linked, now they're separate. But we actually have to use Guttmacher, a pro-abortion source for most of our abortion statistics, because California and New York don't report their abortion stats to the CDC, which always deflates the abortion numbers. Guttmacher gives us better numbers. But we actually don't know the um, harm rate. The reason we found out that chemical abortion is four times more harmful, ten, 10 times more deadly, and increases emergency-related ER visits, abortion-related ER visits, 500% is through a Medicaid study using data in California of women who are on Medicaid, which is free health care, uh, in, their, in, their, in their abortion related ER visits. We actually don't have a national abortion database or statistics. This limits our ability to study the impact of abortion on American women. So when we're looking at studies through PubMed, the best studies you will find, the studies that are the longest running studies, are studies in countries where abortion is actually not controversial. Uh, a lot of the Norwegian countries we, I often use, I often cite Finnish or Denmark uh, studies, um, because in their country, abortions measure just like any other surgical procedure, uh, and they actually want to know. Uh, and the stats in those countries are alarming. Some of the stats I shared with you about how chemical abortion is polluting our waterways, um, those studies are coming out of Europe because they're now actually going, wait a minute, we're putting these drugs. So I would encourage you if you want more stats to go to PubMed uh, on NIH's website uh, and just type in abortion, whatever, abortion, breast cancer, abortion and suicide, um, birth control, suicide, birth control, uh, you know, whatever you want, you can put it in, and it's um, 
be prepared for a long night because there's a lot to, there's a lot to sift through there. And these are peer reviewed you know studies. I'm sorry. But so I once heard the argument where they said that like there's there's certain animals in the wild that like can abort naturally because they because like if they can't handle it or something like that. So they're trying to say like we should have access to it because it's just a natural thing that happens. And, like I kind of don't. So to like if a koala knows it can't go to college, it can like self-abort. Yeah, like it was pretty much like they're saying oh if they don't have. Or yeah. Or area that just, yeah. Which I feel like that would be more like a miscarriage where they just literally can't support it. Yep. But so I guess how would you kind of argue that point where they're a little more with than a little just sarcasm? Like saying, yeah. Yeah, I would. <clears throat> I would argue with that with sarcasm. Be like, so the koala bear doesn't think she can go to college. She's going to talk about no. What you're talking about are animals that are pregnant that are unable to sustain the pregnancy. And that could be lack of food, that could be stress, you know, not having a safe, you know, little habitat in the tree or whatever. Um, but that would be the same for here, right? So you think about the miscarriage rate of women who are female athletes or women who are very stressed during the first trimester of their pregnancy or women who weren't getting proper nutrition when they're pregnant. That's the same deal. If your body is unable to sustain another human body, which it causes a miscarriage to happen. So that would be the same. I would argue, if you're talking about like the animal kingdom, that's gonna be the same, right? It's not like a, oh, I'm six months and my male koala bear left me type of deal. Now you could say her partner is killed in the wild, she undergoes stress, she's foraging for food, she's not taking care of her pregnant body, and then she miscarriages. Miscarriage. I don't think there's like a thing that goes on in her neurons like abort, abort. That's an interesting cartoon you just put in my head for tonight. Thank you. I have like this little claw bear cartoon in my head. Go on. Great. Thank you. Um, as someone who is also older in the room, um, I wanted to hear your thoughts on the IVF community and their role with abortion, because I know, like, in my own experience, um, I'm 39, and, you know, I, I did the March for Life in, in college and marched and a lot of Catholic um, human centers, a lot of Catholic friends, and within five to ten years, those friends are married and they can't get pregnant, and they run to the IVF clinic, yeah. and I think it's really important for you students who are here, who are in that um, almost next phase of life, the next 10 years, just to kind of know. So I'd just love to hear, I don't know if Students yeah. for Life does work with that, or Thanks. what your thoughts on it. Well, you've got me a gamut of all the hard questions tonight. Thank you for making sure I had that one. Um, yeah, I'll actually hear this sometimes of supporters will say, you know, if you really want an abortion, y'all be pro, or actually, it's usually more you know, like pro-abortion people. He'll go, if you want an abortion, why aren't you protesting IVF clinics? which I think is an interesting acknowledgement of what happens in IVF. Um, this is a hard subject because some of you in this room may have been conceived via IVF. Um, one of our very uh, best and brightest Students for Life activists this weekend, right before he left for the March for Life in our National Summit, who's out with us, he was out at the Supreme Court celebrating the end of Roe vs. Wade. He's Noah's everywhere with us, just found out he was conceived via IVF. And he had a twin who didn't survive. Uh, you want to talk about a, a devastating moment for a young man who knows exactly what happens in IVF to be told that from his parents. Um, pretty hard. Pretty hard to take that. Um, but I think we also have to acknowledge the pain of infertility. Um, I think it's a wonderful thing that so many amazing people want to be parents. I mean, it's a natural thing, right, to want to be parents, to create and leave a legacy, a better you on this earth, right? My children, some of them look like me, but they're going to be a whole hell of a lot better human beings than I am, right? That's my goal. My, my goal as a Catholic is to make them be saints. I didn't name them after saint names. 
So everyone gets snarky with me about that. But we're making new saints over here in the Hawkins family. Um, but the reality is the science doesn't change. No matter what my feelings are on it, um, no matter how difficult it may be, um, the reality is what happens inside of an IVF clinic is that egg and sperm are used and put together in a petri dish uh, and a new human being is created. Our non-Catholic Christian friends would say, well, that's fine as long as you implant all of the embryos. That's very difficult to do though because a lot of those embryos don't survive. The embryos are also screened. They're screened for things like Down syndrome. They're screened for certain cancers. There's actually no law in America today that says that the IVF practitioner can't just eliminate the girls or only implant the boys with blonde hair, blue eyes. There's no laws. It's probably one of the most unregulated industries in our country today that, by the way, isn't actually really successful at helping couples get pregnant. NAPRO technology is wildly more successful than IVF. IVF, I think it's like 25% annual success rate uh, of IVF. Costs tens of thousands of dollars for each time. Harms women's fertility. And by the way, has created generations of kids who are in test tubes. Some of whom may never ever be born. IVF ends human life. And as much as we may personally want to get pregnant, my wants, my desires does not give me the right to create other human beings. Because becoming a parent, it's a privilege. It's an honor. It's a duty. But it's not a right. And I think we have to keep that in mind. And I know for some of you who are like, I'm not thinking about being a parent yet. You know, especially the boys. Like, this is awkward. I just want to graduate and get a good job. You will want to create a new human being one day. And the question is, are you treating that new human being that you haven't even created like, like a commodity? Like it's your right? It's your right to have a child? Or is it your privilege? Is it your honor? And the last time I checked, there's about 100,000 children in foster care in America today who are waiting, whose parental rights have been extinguished who are waiting for adoptive parents. There's tens of thousands of babies across the world in orphanages thanks to a UN resolution that uh, built a lot of those orphanages that are waiting for parents. So you can create a family. You can love on children. You can share your, your love and your wealth and your success and all the cool things you as a human being you, bring to this world with another human being, even if you can't biologically create another human being. But I think we have to remember that being a parent is a privilege. It's not a right. And when we start saying it's our right, then we start saying things like, well, it's also my right to end that life. It's a slippery slope. And as we've seen, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. We actually do. Um, I have. I don't have the statistics in front of me. I just did a podcast. Uh, it's coming out. It's from my podcast, mostly pro life, um, with Herbie Newell. I just filmed it this past Thursday. But it's like Christians are like three times more likely to adopt. So it's funny. It's like you pro lifers. I'm like, yeah. It's literally us pro lifers who are the biggest advocates of adoption and actually have adopted or have said that we've actively considered or actively considering adopting our foster parent. So statistically, yeah, it is actually pro-lifers who are doing that over the general adult audience and population in our country. So there's that answer. I think the other answer is, I think there's a lot of confusion about what foster care is and what foster care isn't. Foster care, the goal of foster care is not to get you a baby. 
It's not adoption. It's actually family reunification. It's trying to keep parents together. Um, and so there's about 400 some thousand children in foster care in our country today. Um, only a quarter of them are looking to be adopted. The rest of them are in care while their parents are incarcerated or their parents are in drug rehab or they're waiting to get the approval to live with their grandparents. The, the goal of foster care is not adoption. It's family reunification and we need to say that over and over again. And yes, there are things wrong with the foster care system. Absolutely, there are things wrong with our adoption system in our country and the commoditization of human beings and how expensive it is to say you want to adopt in our country. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that justifies uh, the, the ending of human life. Um, that doesn't justify it. It just doesn't justify it. Um, and so I, that's kind of how I answer that question today um, is that there's just because someone may suffer or we think that they may suffer because um, I hear all the time well this kid's going to be stuck in foster care okay interesting uh, are you against the legalization of drugs in our country no okay well then shut up because if you want to talk about the children who are in foster care today, it's drug abuse. Majority of those children are there because of drug abuse. So if you really care, you would have something to say about drug use in American society today. So okay, one, there. Uh, and then two, um, the question is what, even if a child does end up in foster care, what makes you the arbiter that their life isn't worthy of living? All of us will struggle with our life. All of us will have hard times in our life. Some of it, other people may know. Some of our struggles, people may never know what they are. But that doesn't mean just because we have struggle, just because we will, we will face hard times, doesn't mean we're, we're, our lives are unworthy of life. Or that we have power to say, oh, they're not like us because they're in foster care, therefore they should have been aborted, and let's back up and make some sort of national policy. Because the last time I checked, when you look at the statistics, child abuse rates have only gone up since abortion was legalized in our country. They haven't gone down. We will take one more question. You guys have the best questions for a friendly audience. I usually don't like to speak to friendly audiences because you don't ask any hard questions. But I think that guy like Roger said, good job, good job, protester. Okay, so with these conversations, like obviously both people feel very strongly that they're right. So we're still called to like love people that disagree with us. So how do we love people well even if we're like on the way opposite sides yeah. of this conversation? Well, I, mean, I think loving somebody is telling someone the truth. And so you can have um, an opposing conversation with somebody and vehemently disagree and still love that person. I mean, I love Dave Matthews. I love Dave Matthews. It's like my one career objective I haven't achieved yet, besides abolishing abortion. I mean, Rose in reverse, but if we got to abolish abortion, I want to convert Dave Matthews. I know if I got in a room with Dave Matthews just like half an hour, he may, I mean, I totally changed his mind, but dang it, I will plant that seed, right? But I love Dave Matthews. I love all of his little socialist rants. I love it. But I vehemently disagree because he's completely wrong. He should stick to songwriting, which is what he's good at. You all know who Dave Matthews is, right? Did I age myself? <sighs> okay. Google Dave Matthews band and your life will forever be changed, okay? All right, so I, I think we can do that. I think um, what the, the other woman in Scrubs who brought it up earlier that I loved. I think there's a song, but no one got it. Okay. Um, what she brought up earlier that I loved was that the hurt of those who advocate for abortion. Because I can disagree with that dude all day long. Like, am I going to go back to my hotel room and be like, oh, God, I'm flat, I'm short, no, 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 no. Nope, literally doesn't bother me at all. Do I have any hate in my heart for them? Nope. Do I have a little bit of sadness for him? Yeah. But I can still disagree with him. But I, I, I think it's just about, in your heart, like are you harboring like animosity towards that person? And um, 
I, I think what helps me as someone who's like uber competitive and I'm not like the nicest person in the world. I don't, I don't know what people think I am. I'm, I'm not really that nice. I'm just me. But um, at least I don't think, I think I could be a whole lot nicer maybe, let's put it that way. But I think the, the, the thing that you've got to do is just, for me, it's I have to constantly remind myself that those people who come in, yell at me, call me a fascist, which I really don't like. Um, I did not appreciate that. Um, those are hurting people. And we see it over and over again in the pro-life movement. The nastiest people, the meanest people who will come up to you, who will say things to you, who will cause you problems, are the most wounded. And with, a, with 50 years of abortion in our country, we're literally a nation of walking wounded people. Like every time we talk about this issue, we're talking in front of those who've been hurt by abortion, who've been lied to by the abortion industry, who have to constantly fight and feel like they have to fight to justify their pro-abortion views in order to, to tamp down those feelings inside of them that maybe I did something wrong. I mean, the woman, the, I remember I was in Ireland when Justice Kavanaugh was uh, sworn in on this, he was, uh, his nomination passed the Senate, right? So he was getting, he was going to be on the Supreme Court. And I'll never forget, I was in Ireland doing this like terrible, terrible night tour of Dublin with my mom. And we were watching it on Facebook and my friend was out there, some of my students were like, and they were out there like clawing at the doors of the Supreme Court. I mean like clawing at the door at the, like they're like they're like bronze plated doors like they weren't going to move these doors but they but making complete and utter fools of themselves those are wounded women those are hurting women who have to keep telling themselves abortion has to be legal because therefore I don't have to think about anything I did wrong I didn't do anything wrong abortion is legal if you're totally fine with your decision you made for abortion, then why wouldn't you be okay with somebody else saying they're not okay with it? Because you're pro-choice, right? If you're pro-choice, then, dude, why do you care what I say? You chose abortion. Your girlfriend chose abortion. Why do you care what I have to say? Why do you need me to say abortion's okay? What's broken inside of you? That you have to say, you need everybody around you to say, you made the right choice, you made the right choice, you made the right choice, you made the right choice. So I think that takes this meaning of a person, Kristen, and helps give me compassion towards those who treat me badly or say they, my, my daughter should be raped, for example. It helps me have compassion towards them, is that they're wounded and they're broken. Also... Just from a pragmatic standpoint, when they start yelling at you, make sure you have your friends. Make sure you have somebody who's kind of like, eh, still feeling out the whole thing, watching. They make more pro-lifers than I do. I, this is why I love when protesters come to my events. Because I feel like, and I can see, I don't have a little GoPro on me, it would look weird, but... I can see it in the eyes of the people who are kind of just figuring out where they stand on this issue. The more I can draw their radical opinions out of them, for them to say the quiet part out loud, like it's a fetus, it's a human being, yeah, I know that, and I still don't care, I don't really need them to say anything else. Because the majority of people will be like, ooh, they just admitted it's a baby. I'm not okay with that. And that changes minds. So let them come out and yell at you. Try to draw them out. Be like, what do you mean by that? Explain. What choice are you talking about? Choice to do what? Have them actually say the quiet thing out loud. Because that will actually change the minds more than what sometimes I can even say to a pro-choice audience. Hearing it come from their mouths, not my mouth, works. Thank you.